Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Edward Jeregin. I'm the uh, director of Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. And uh, I want to welcome our distinguished guests and all the ladies and gentlemen who are here uh, to, Rice, to our institute for what I'm sure will be a very engaging discussion this afternoon on uh, the <clears throat> key issue of controlling corruption in Latin America. Uh, this conference is organized uh, by the Baker Institute's Mexico Center and Latin America Initiative. And I want to take a moment uh, to recognize Erica de la Garza, the program director for the Latin America Institute. Erica has been with us from the very beginning, and we've had an extensive involvement in public policy issues involving Latin America uh, over the past 20 years, and, and Erica has helped shape the Institute's research and programs about this very important region. Uh, this is the final conference Erica will direct over the course of her time at the Institute, so please join me in thanking her for all of her efforts. So over the next five years, the Baker Institute's aim is to be more comprehensive in our core areas of research, including the study of the rule of law in Latin America. I don't have to tell this group that in Latin America, major scandals and people's direct experiences with self-dealing public officials have placed corruption at the top of the list of main concerns facing the region today. To be clear, there is much that the residents of, say, Brazil, Guatemala, Mexico, Peru can be proud of. Elections in Latin America are free and fairer than they used to be, and with the rare exception, political power in Latin America uh, is no longer monopolized by a single individual, military junta, or political party. Legal reforms have promoted higher levels of government transparency and citizen participation. Organized civil society is wielding new and innovative tactics to promote greater accountability. And the region's residents are using social media as throughout the world to shame those who abuse their power and to coordinate collective action. Nonetheless, the other side of the coin is very challenging. And in spite of these and other positive developments, the region continues to grapple with what we can only call systemic corruption. There is much work that is still needed to strengthen the rule of law. Also, we are witnessing serious instability in Venezuela and the return of populist leaders in the region. One can say in Mexico, AMLO is a populist leader. In Brazil, from the left. In Brazil, we have a populist leader from the right. Some of my colleagues here in America may say we have a populist leader in Washington. But the rule of populist leaders is uh, another sort of challenge whether from the right or the left. So our goal with this event is to assist with that worthy mission by encouraging a thoughtful discussion about corruption and how it might be controlled. Uh, so the Baker Institute has brought together an extraordinary group of experts you can see in the program in front of you from different corners of the United States and from Latin America. I just had the privilege of having some private time with Claudia Gonzalez from Mexico, who's doing pioneer work in Mexico in anti-corruption programs. So I thank you for being part of this important event, and, and please join me now in welcoming our keynote speaker. <clears throat> Susan Rose Ackerman is the Henry Luce Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University. I have a particular prejudice for Yale since our daughter went there, and she keeps telling me that her father is highly deficient intellectually because I only went to Georgetown. As the author of multiple publications on corruption, <clears throat> she is one of the premier thought leaders on this topic, and her presentation today will contribute greatly to our understanding of what is undoubtedly a very complex problem. So please wel welcome, help me welcome Susan Rose Ackerman, our keynote speaker, to the podium. So let me be sure I know how this works. Uh, here. Oh, there we go. There you okay, go. there we go. You got it. 
<coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna get, get some water up here. Um, so, I'm going to use my talk to introduce <coughs> people to the question of the relationship between corruption and government with some application to Latin America, but <coughs> not particularly about Latin America. You can make the connections or see where they don't, where they don't, where they don't fit. Um, <coughs> so I should first mention that one of the things I most recently did in the field is be part of a expert advisory committee with the Inter-American Development Bank that <coughs> sorry, put out a report in, um, in December, which I think is on the website of the, um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the conference. Um, and um, so I hope some of you will be interested enough to go and, and look at that, and that, uh, at that <coughs> report, and I, I hope it has some effect on, on the IDB and the way in which they think about the, about the, about the issue. So what is corruption? Well, this is one of these words that everybody has their own definition for something they don't like. Um, and, um, and, and we can talk about this later, but I, 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 a kind of common definition is the abuse of entrusted or, private, or public power for private uh, gain. But of course, you look at that definition, you see all the, everything has to be defined, abuse, entrusted, power, private gain, uh, what things are acceptable and what things are, 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 are not. Um, one response is sometimes, I couldn't help it, I was in a system that made me do it. Um, and so, in fact, one of the things I particularly want to think about is when does that make some sense? When is it that various systems produce conditions in which corruption is more or less, more or less, more or less likely? Let me see if this all works here. Yes, uh, these nice power, this nice PowerPoint uh, is thanks to my co-author Bonnie Palefka, who's a professor in, at Monterey uh, Tech, and so we, we have we have little uh, have a little animation here, um, and this is basically to illustrate all the different complicated relationships that can occur uh, that get the label of, 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 of corruption. So from um, uh, uh, heads of government stealing and embezzling money from the government treasury to bureaucrats, judiciary, top political officials, the legislature, um, um, obtaining private benefits for themselves uh, uh, from, uh, from firms and, uh, who want to get contracts, uh, from firms who want to evade taxes or, or, or regulations, or legislators maybe paying voters to, um, you know, to, vote, uh, to, vote, to vote for them. And then, of course, there can be entirely private uh, co uh, corruption, commercial bribery, uh, in which um, people who are employees of firms uh, engage in corruption for their own personal uh, gain. There we go. Um, let me just briefly talk for a minute about these cross-country measures of corruption, which probably most of you have come across if you read the papers at all. Um, these are the ones that have gotten the most play are not hard measures of corruption. They're perceptions. Uh, they are uh, they're, um, compilations of surveys that have been done with various degrees of rigor, um, as usually asking a question, um, how corrupt do you think you know, Chile is, how corrupt do you think Brazil is on a scale of, you know, one to six or one to 10? So they're pretty uh, vague, and it's not sure exa clear exactly what they are measuring. And of course, they're not hard numbers, they're indexes. Um, there's on a scale of one to six or one to 10, right? So people use them in statistical analysis, uh, but it's not like measuring somebody's height, you know, or, or um, weight or something. Um, this is just a illustration of on the one side, the, um, the Transparency International Index, which goes from, from, uh, from one to 10. You know, it's like gymnastic scoring, right? So 10 is good uh, and, and one is, is, is bad. And we just put a, a few countries in there so you can kind of see where they are. This is a few years ago. You should go look at, on, your, on the internet for transparency um, uh, um, uh, on their website and you will, the new one just came out yesterday, right? And so I think U.S. instead of being 17 is 22. Right? Um, I don't know where the other countries are. We have Mexico down here and as um, as 102nd out of 175. This is another index that was put out by the World Bank Index, World Bank Institute. It's basically the same index. 
It, it, they measure it differently. They center it on zero. They, they get all these numbers and they put them together and they say, okay, well, take zero as the middle and then they have, they don't have a, they don't have a one to 10 thing. They have a, a variance on both sides. Uh, but you, you shouldn't think of them as distinct. They're really based on some of the same background uh, information. But you, the point is you see a big range um, I think it's measuring something about some problems with the relationship between the public and the, and the government, or the private sector and, and, and the government, but it's not very precise and it's not really a policy tool other than as a way of raising, um, um, raising awareness. Say, you know, the people working on corruption in Mexico, as I gather some here, might point, look where Mexico is. We have to really worry about it. But then there's a next step. Okay, now what, right? Um, this is a, a similar uh, thing uh, um, out of a, one of Paul Lagunas' chapters that just does, uses the same basic data to only look at Latin America and to uh, show you that um, on these kind of indices, uh, Chile and Uruguay and Costa Rica to some extent show as much less corrupt compared with a whole bunch of other countries that are sort of pretty similar. Um, and uh, Venezuela down in the in, in the down near the near, near the bottom here, and this is in um, uh, putting together last five years about right. And those those lines on either side are are giving you some indication of how much variation there was across the different surveys. It isn't really a an error. It's not a standard error of the underlying problem. It's the it's whether the different surveys all came up with the same thing. Right. So there's a problem here. We got they're sort of in the below the middle. Right? Uh, but I'm an old microeconomist. I'm never so much interested in like the whole, th the whole country, but trying to parse it down and look at different sectors and see what's going on in different sectors. Um, so this is something called the Global Corruption Barometer, which asks people, um, f which sectors do you think are the most corrupt, right? Not, it's, it ha also you see has weaknesses, it's just what do you think, rather than what, what have you experienced? Well, not too surprisingly, the police show up if you think for a minute, you can, I think, understand why the police are a special problem. Um, very often, they can come, they can uh, ask you for bribes without your having to say, I want to interact with you. They decide they want to interact with you, and then they ask for a bribe. But notice also, parliament and legislatures, political parties, I think that's sort of a fake, probably. I mean, that's a indication, in the sense of actual bribes changing hands. This is showing a, a, a level of distrust in these sort of political institutions when you ask them, but probably most households have not actually bribed their legislator or their political party. Um, maybe they've been paid to vote, I don't know. But, it's, uh, but then you see other sectors, the military, the media, education systems, um, which suggests if you see corruption as being a problem, that uh, there's something in the way in which those services are delivered that need to be thought about. I actually find more important, from the policy point of view, this kind of data, which shows you, which asks people, which parts of government did you interact with, and if you interacted with it, did you or somebody in your family have to pay a bribe? Now, people might lie, but you can hope that they lie, they, they're sort of like systematic lying, right? So, so that the relative differences are relatively uh, uh, informative. Uh, so utilities, are you paying you know, to get free electricity or to get hooked up you know, to a telephone or something? Uh, tax, the tax collectors, um, education can take, of course, many different forms, similarly medical, we can talk about this later if you want, land, uh, transfers, um, regist registering certain kinds of businesses, uh, the judiciary. Note the judiciary is interesting because most people don't interact with the judiciary. This is given that you go to the courts, um, what do you report in terms of, of corruption, either of the lower level clerks or of the judges themselves in, in terms of outcome? And of course the police show up here uh, once, once again in, that, in, this, in this thing. So this suggests some sectors, you would want to do this country by country of course, and people have done this, so, the sectors where you might want to think about um, uh, how the system could be reformed to reduce corrupt, uh, to reduce corrupt incentives. This is another look at Latin America, just asking about urban corruption. In other words, um, um, once again, from something out of one of Paul's chapters, um, where you, you see, once again, Chile and El Salvador seeming to be not so uh, and now, El Salvador, interestingly, that's kind of odd, right? Uh, um, uh, maybe it's just the government does so little that nobody finds it worthwhile paying to get anything, right? Um, 
Um, and um, you, have to, you have to think about it, those sorts of things. So we see a range of, of, of problems with people reporting uh, bribes, um, and it's processing, processing a particular municipal, uh, a municipal document. Quite a lot of variation, but I'm suggesting that there are a number of countries where this is a serious, uh, these are serious problems. Um, all right, I won't, this is, this is, this is just too many, too many words to make any sense, but it's, um, it's, it's just showing you, look, there's a lot of different ways in which corruption that lead to corrupt um, uh, interactions, and the consequences of corruption are a whole range of different things around the bottom uh, that have to do with certain things having to do with macro um, uh, performance of the economy, and other things having to do with the way in which particular sectors work or with the way in which the government, the government works. Um, it's interesting, if you follow the IMF, the IMF for many years was saying, oh, we're not really interested in corruption. That's not macroeconomics. Um, and a number of us, myself included, but other people, were trying to tell the IMF, look, you're wrong about that. If you have a lot of corruption in your country, the data that you've got on investment is wrong, right? It's not indicating much about how good investment is for economic growth if the things that it's being spent on are not very useful or distorted by, 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 um, by payoffs. All right, so here's a, a little stylized thing here that shows you the relationship between the corruption index um, and, um, and the human development index. This is slightly better than GDP. In other words, it includes um, it includes an education measure and a, a health measure, and, and income enters in, in the log, meaning that when you're very rich, an extra dollar doesn't count very much and giving you, you know, a higher number. So you see a rough correlation here that the countries that are richer are, tend to be less, less corrupt, but there's two things to notice about this. One is there's a lot of variation. There's a lot going on in the middle. You know, if you, if you kind of chopped off the top and bottom, you'd, you'd, see a, uh, you'd see something that says, look, it's not just enough to get rich. Right? The second thing that's complicated is we don't know which way the causation goes. Is it get rich and you'll get honest? Or is it if you're not, if you're very corrupt, you can't get rich, right? You're, you're, you're being held into some kind of a, of a trap, kind of a corruption trap that you, that you can't get out of. And I think it's, it's gonna be both, right? So um, it's very easy to, to, to come up with stories about vicious and virtuous cycles where corruption builds on corruption, um, and distrust builds on distrust, and um, uh, it's, it's one thing I know Matt has particularly been interested in, but I have, of course, too, and to what extent can you pull pieces, if you, if you have those things going on, are there ways to pull out certain parts of the economy to, that are, are the society to, um, to deal with corruption, even if you've got it fairly entrenched in other, in other areas? Well, of course, the first thing people think of is the criminal law. Right? Uh, use the criminal law to deter bribery. This is all the big Lava Jato in, 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 um, in, in Brazil and in other, other countries as, 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 as well. Um, the usual story, we want to try to not just punish people, but deter people going forward. So we want to make it fairly sure that they're going to get um, uh, caught, and, and if they're caught, that they're punished in a way that deters them. And since the chance of being caught for corruption is often very low, that implies the punishment needs to reflect that fact that the, that the um, chance of being caught is, 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 uh, is, is fairly low. But I want to leave that to one side. Maybe some of the rest of you later this afternoon will talk about, about that. Um, I want to talk about um, other ways of thinking about um, uh, dealing, with, dealing with corruption. And I'd be interested in the, other, in the Latin American uh, um, uh, uh, experiences here. Um, so first, let's talk about bureaucratic corruption briefly. Um, and there are different ways in which corruption can show up um, in, um, in, a, in a bureaucratic context. One is the official has some fixed amount of something to give out, and there are many more people who want it than the fixed amount. Uh, places in public housing in the U.S. is a, great, is a good example. Um, certain kinds of licenses to run casinos in, in Louisiana is another example, right? Um, and so people fight for that fixed supply, and one way to, to fight for it is to, is to bribe, to, to, try to, be the high, to be, try to be the high briber. Um, and, and, and if there are other criteria for you, you, the, the, the state has some criteria other than the highest willingness to pay, there's going to be a problem. 
Similarly, there may be variations in quality and, and, um, and, and, um, and quantity uh, and that, that are setting qualifications to get something. Um, and you may want to get the benefit when you don't have those qualifications. You may want to get admitted to a university even though you don't have the grades. You may want to get a, um, you know, some kind of a license to um, operate a profession uh, when you don't have the, the, um, the, the qualifications. Um, and similarly, choosing those who, are, who qualify is kind of mixing together. There's a scarcity of the thing, and there's a way we're supposed to make the decision is not by auctioning it off, but by, um, by um, choosing who's qualified. Um, and, um, uh, and, and you see bribes that are, way, are sometimes used as ways of incentivizing officials to, you know, to, uh, to do things. So this is just a chart showing irregular payments and bribes as a function of the number of days it takes to start a, uh, to start a business. Um, just showing that, it, that you, you can't say, well, look, these are terrific because they, they, um, they make it easy to get a business, to get a business started. Um, all right, so this is just, we already said this, really. Um, so how can we think about policy here, right? So one policy is just get rid of the program. The program's so corrupt that even though, in an honest world, you might want to have it, if it's, if it's become so corrupt, maybe it should just be gotten rid of, right? Um, and and that's, that's a kind of a desperate answer, but it might be, well, good as you can do in some situations. The second one is ask yourself, as, as, as sort of economic actors, maybe you should just legalize the bribes. Maybe you should just, and I don't mean really legalize the bribes, I mean use legal fees, legal prices, sell the scarce thing. My always example of this is the U.S. Passport Office, right, which says um, if you want a passport fast, you can pay for it, legally, pay for it. Um, and um, there may be other kinds of scarce things. I think a good example which is an import quota, you know, where the, the, the government says we want to control capital imports. Good economists wouldn't like that, but suppose you got it. Um, well, shouldn't that go to the firms that are going to use it the best? And who are those? Well, they're probably the ones that will pay the most to get it. So you just, government should just sell it off, right? And if you have some objection to that, if you think, no, it should go to the worthy ones or something, well, then, of course, that's not a good solution. Um, um, avoid things like just saying, oh, it's so corrupt, we should just keep the program but cut the budget back, right? That's just asking for more, uh, more corruption. Just, or, or think about that you reform in one area, maybe you're going to be increasing uh, corrupt incentives uh, somewhere, um, uh, 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 somewhere else. Um, and it's, um, uh, this is particularly pushing back against Gary Becker, who, a famous economist from, uh, who used to be at the University of Chicago, who has several things in which he says, you want to get rid of corruption? Cut government. Huh? I mean, that's obviously overly simple. I mean, as I said, sometimes you might want to just get rid of programs, but it's a, um, it is a, it's a completely, to me, cynical way of, 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 of thinking about the problem rather than understanding the, the good things that governments can do. Um, so you, thinking about then reforming programs so that there aren't so many rents, in other words, so there aren't so many spaces in the program for, um, for bribes to be, to be paid. These are just some examples. Simplifying revenue collection with fewer steps and lower rates. Um, uh, have a um, uh, uh, think about clarifying what the regulatory um, programs uh, are. Um, maybe there's ways you can reform benefit programs uh, to um, uh, reduce the amount of discretion that the public officials have. Um, there's a lot of discussion that some of you may probably have more insights than I do on whether e-government, to what extent you know, IT or internet governments can be helpful. I think it can sometimes, I think sometimes people are overly excited about it, but it can be something where um, it, it can be used as a way of routinizing and simplifying the way a program operates and reducing the amount of discretion um, uh, 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 that's, that's available. And that's going to always be a trade-off in anti-corruption is do we want to reduce uh, discretion, uh, routinize things, put things online, and recognize that that, of course, can have a cost on the other side uh, because people can't make uh, sensitive judgments about who deserves uh, something in a non-corrupt way. Right? All right, let's talk about procurement for a little bit. Um, uh, uh, I know we'll be talking about this somewhat more um, uh, later. Uh, TI's got some estimates of, of, of procurement being uh, corruption, uh, increasing the cost of of procurement by a lot. This is just, this is not about corruption directly. The corruption is inferred, right? So this is, 
cost overruns, right? There's uh, p people who've done a lot across a lot of different projects. Those are the red things for road projects, bridges and tunnels, rail projects. And then somebody did estimates, people did estimates for particular things. Um, the Erie Canal, the Panama Canal, it'd be nice to see one for the current you know, uh, improve, improvement in the Panama Canal. Hoover Dam, a big dig in Boston, which is a big bridge and tunnel project. Oh, this, we do have the expansion of the Panama Canal, I forgot. Uh, uh, it's estimated to have, have there be over the projected. The Sochi Olympic Games are huge. Now, of course, it almost always happens that the costs are greater than the estimates ahead of time. And, and so that not all of this is going to be corruption, but it leaves the fact that it's so common to have cost overruns leaves open a space for, for corruption to be part of the reason uh, for it. So when you're talking about procurement, uh, uh, you can talk about corruption at the level of the specification of what you're going to build. I had a project, read a, read a, read a project about Nigeria in which they, they talked about how the business community got together and decided what to ask the government to build. Right? So the corruption was built in at the very, very beginning. The pre-bid process, who gets advertised to, how do they qualify uh, people, um, the evaluation of the, of the, um, of the bids. Um, if, if you have corruption at some of those early stages, the bid evaluation project can look as if it's very nice and clean, but the whole the fix was in in the earlier, earlier stages. And then very important, the post-bid thing, right? How easy is it to go back to say, you get them at one level and then come back and say, okay, we've got this bridge half built. Um, how about you know, giving us uh, some more? That's not always, it's facilitated by corruption, but it's also related to the nature of large infrastructure uh, projects. Um, all right, I just already talked about macroeconomics. Uh, um, you might be interested in, in Olderbrecht in, in, for this um, region. Um, the big Brazilian uh, construction company that has a big, had a big plea uh, agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice and Brazil and, um, and, and Switzerland. They ran a kickback operation with its division of structured operations, you know, kind of nice euphemism for what they were doing, headquartered in the Dominican Republic that basically organized the corruption. It was very, very in, um, institutionalized and organized. Um, and, um, um, and, and the plea deal, um, lets you make some calculations of the um, relationship between the size of the bribes and the benefits that the company said that they got. And this is a nice puzzle to think about because I really don't understand these numbers. Now, maybe they're, you know, of course, they could just not be good numbers, which is possible. But you see the, quite a big, this is the bribe payments as a percent of the benefits that Alderbrick told the Department of Justice they had made on these different deals. Um, uh, Petrobras in Brazil, they said it's 18%. Transport projects, 11%. Rio construction, about 7%. Other countries, it's higher. And the, the weird thing to me is the highest ratio between bribe payments and reported benefits is in the countries that, a country that you would think would have very low bargaining power with respect to Olderbrick, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala. So I know there's somebody from Guatemala. You can tell me why is that? Or maybe it's just, I get different answers. We can talk about that later. Uh, um, but it's, at least it's, even if you think there's a lot of noise in these numbers, uh, it's at least indicating that these, this is a profitable operation for Olderbrecht to um, put these uh, things in and over long periods, over long periods of time. Um, so um, uh, it implies that when you're thinking about reform for procurement, we're talking about how much how much uh, discretion is given to the to the to, to the procurement officers and the firms that they're dealing with. Um, professionalization. I've been I've always as a question for you thought that one route into uh, a um, to dealing with corruption is go through the professionals, the lawyers, the architects. Um, um, the accountants, who one assumes have some kind of professional norms that they should be following, and if they are just looking the other way while corruption goes on for some years, um, it, it's, it's a question, right? How, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And can that, can, are, are they a, are they a, a locus of, of, of reform uh, efforts? Well, it seemed to me they, they, they ought to be. Um, Monitoring what happens so that you know what's what's uh, gone on, more transparency of what about what the contracts are, who's paying for them, um, and how the firms are, are performing. 
Um, so let's uh, just talk briefly about, I mean, there's a whole range of things called political corruption, right? So some of that's bound up with these big infrastructure projects or with quid pro quos that have to do with more day-to-day -day, um, uh, projects that ordinary are services that ordinary people are, 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 are dealing with. Now we have here the, on the one side, people trying to buy political influence, and on the other side, political uh, actors uh, wanting to buy um, uh, uh, votes. Um, so, um, which raises this, these, these questions, which I would put in a kind of a gray area. Obvious political campaigns have to be financed. Obviously, politicians ought to learn about what um, all the different interest groups in society want. You wouldn't want to say lobbying is always corrupt. I think it's, it's necessary. It's a necessary part of government to have those, 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 those interactions. But it's when it becomes a route for uh, a kind of personal quid pro quo that we have, that we have, uh, have, 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 have problems um, and can be linked to procurement, uh, to procurement, uh, to procurement corruption as, as, uh, as, as, as well. Um, so we've got these, this is once again, um, people's beliefs. Do you think that voters are bribed fairly often or very often? Right? And um, it's a little surprising to me how big those numbers are, but and they vary. You've got Netherlands and Rwanda up at the top. Rwanda doesn't really have very competitive elections, I must say. Uh, Uruguay and Chile up at the top. And um, uh, the Brazilians are particularly skeptical. They're, I'm sure you can't read it, but they're down at the, at the um, bottom. This is not what actually, this is not the truth of the matter, right? This is the, um, this is partly, this is reflecting some public uh, dissatisfaction with the way in which the political system is, 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 um, is operating. Uh, but it does at least, uh, is a, a, a suggestion that in some countries this is something that needs to be at least thought about. Um, beyond the, the ballot box is the issue of independent judicial institutions and anti-corruption um, uh, agencies. Um, I guess that we'll be talking somewhat later, in, uh, particularly we have somebody, a prosecutor from Brazil, uh, about how do you keep courts independent. There's been, there was one of the earliest things the World Bank did in the legal reform area had to do with corruption in the judiciary in Latin America, uh, where there was seen to be problems just in the way in which sometimes the court cases were were, were, were organized, people, judge could meet with one party and not the other, uh, lack of transparency about what, was, about what was going on. On the other hand, you certainly have some countries with very strong independent uh, judiciaries and independent uh, prosecutors, and also the use of alternative dispute resolution uh, 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 mechanisms to resolve certain kinds of things. And as well as anti-corruption agencies, which have a kind of a mixed record around the world, uh, but the people who have studied it, particularly a woman at the World Bank, Francesca Riccanatini, shows the, um, the, the, the wide variation in these things. They're not always just captured by the, by the government or set up to not work. They can be set up so they can be truly, uh, truly uh, independent. Um, this is just a correlation between judicial independence and some measure of corruption or diversion of public funds. Once again, it's not telling you much about why. It's just saying maybe there's something in here to be, you know, to um, uh, 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 to um, uh, to look at. But so this is just what I was saying about anti-corruption agencies that the, the successful ones have some independent political support that isn't too um, intrusive. You know, so it lets them do their uh, do their work. Some independent uh, sources of funding. Um, some uh, cooperation, some, some power to bring, to bring cases, as well as to also do structural reform, not just have them as a criminal justice, um, uh, criminal justice activity. Um, I think one thing I hope we'll talk about uh, later is the whole, whole notions of openness and accountability of information and auditing, uh, the role of the media, um, the role of nonprofits as agents of change, um, and avenues for individual complaints. You know, you're getting a little pushback recently from some people saying, oh, transparency, that's not so, you know, why are you calling this thing Transparency International? You know, what's, maybe transparency isn't always so good. And I think the, the argument is, if all you're going to be is transparent, right? if you're just gonna tell everybody, look how corrupt we all are, 
That's not really going to do much. Right? In fact, that might just encourage all the people who aren't already corrupt to say, well, look, everybody else is corrupt. I guess I'll be it be too. Right? So it's, it is important that, that people know what's happening, that, we think that, that information not be suppressed, but that it be a piece of a, of a, of a, broader, uh, of a, of a broader program along the lines that I was sort of summarizing very quickly um, uh, before. Let me just end by thinking, just say a couple things about international business. Um, and the obligations of multinational forms. I would want to argue that corporations do have an obligation to behave morally in some sense. We could argue about how far that goes, but at the very least, not to be corrupt, because a corporation only exists at the, um, um, because the law has allowed them to exist. They're not like you and me, right? They're, they only exist because a, a legal system thinks that they're, they're on base of balance doing something good. So um, to me, that means that, that the, the quid pro quo for that is that they have some obligation to behave in ways that are supportive of the, of the, of the market and of the, and of the state that have allowed them to, allowed them to exist. This is just, uh, just countering a claim. Oh, we're just, a poor, we're just a poor little company. What do you expect of us? Right? It's just a simple chart that just has big companies in one, one thing. And, and countries on the other thing, to just illustrate how the GDP of certain countries, certain, certain countries matches the, the um, um, revenue, gross revenue, of, of, um, of, a, of a range of different companies. You could, you could, you could do that you know, yourself for the ones in, we could do that for Latin America and see what we get. Um, let me just end by, because uh, I think I'm running out of time, um, uh, an important set of things to be worried about, to just put on the table, is money laundering and organized crime. Um, uh, maybe Louise will be talking about this more, um, more later. Um, having my co-author in my second edition of my corruption book being somebody who teaches in Monterey um, really helped push me to think more about that overlap you know, between, between crime and illicit financial uh, 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 shifts um, and, and corruption as a facilitator where the underlying problem is not so much the corruption, the corruption is, is, um, is, is facilitating. So just to end, um, corruption I think is a crime of opportunity and calculation you know, culture may be involved, but it also is related to people seeing places where they can benefit. Um, can be influenced by cultural differences, but there's a lot that has to do with what the underlying structures like and about the institutions in which everybody is, 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 um, is operating. It certainly occurs between private bodies, like we all know about FIFA. Um, but the particular thing that is most damaging and that I think that I think uh, we're going to be talking about more later today is the, when it affects the functioning of government and leads to a kind of a, of a sense of, of, um, of, um, of impunity by people who are engaged in, 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 in corruption and an and a unhappiness or a dissatisfaction with, with, with state institutions at the, uh, among, the, among the citizens. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the discussion this afternoon. So. Okay. All right. Oh, this is not my pen. I don't know what Susan, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Uh, we're going to get started uh, with a question uh, by Professor Danielson. Daniel, I'm sorry. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to uh, uh, be on uh, uh, discussing um, uh, Professor uh, Rose Ackerman's uh, um, comments, which, uh, you know, or, or, or her. Uh, her keynote address, which you know, she's really one of the the great world experts on this topic, and and I think did a you know a really great job of giving an overview of this uh, of this important uh, topic. Um, you know, there's a question that's been nagging at me uh, for you know 20 plus years as a scholar of uh, political economy, mm -hmm. uh, working on corruption, and and that is why isn't there more of it? Right, uh, and and uh, and I, you know, I, you know, I think we're often focused on, you know, on on its challenges and on the problems that are created, and we're trying to explain it, uh, 
But I guess in, in one sense, I, I'm you know, puzzled about why uh, if people are in positions of power where they can use the power for personal gain, why don't they just maximize their, 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 uh, you know, their um, uh, capturing of, uh, of, of these revenues, you know, bribes or, or, or whatever. Uh, and, and so I think um, I, I want us to think a little bit more about how um, they're, you know, sort of, in political economy, we often take sort of an, uh, a, a rationalist or economic approach to this, right? Sort of, you don't, you, you don't engage in corruption when the costs of that corruption outweigh the benefits to you uh, of engaging. I think that's a very useful way of approaching this. But I wonder if there might be another way too, right? And this is more, you know, the way maybe psychologists might approach this, right? Which is, um, you don't engage in corruption because it's just not okay, right? Uh, in fact, you might not even think about it. And interesting work on this was done by uh, Fisman and Miguel. They have a, a piece in the Journal of Political Economy where they uh, looked at traffic violations in New York City among diplomats, right, who all have diplomatic immunity. Uh, and, and what they found was that, uh, that the, 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 the number of parking tickets by, by diplomat, by country, uh, actually correlated pretty well with Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, um, uh, which is interesting, right? So, you know, the, the, the people, diplomats from countries that, that had higher corruption ratings tended to, you know, uh, have more parking violations, of course, which they didn't have to pay. Um, one Canadian official actually did get a parking ticket, but promptly paid it, even though, uh, you know, he had diplomatic immunity. And so um, there might be something about, about the, the, the sort of cultural norms that are driving, uh, you know, people's behavior that have, you know, a big influence on, on, on how corruption uh, takes place. And so, um, uh, right, so, the, so that's one question is how much can psych human psychology be harnessed to, to combat corruption? Uh, and, and how much of the, the lack of corruption if you think about it that way, might be explained by those, uh, you know, sense of, of norms of what's appropriate. Um, a second question, a large question that I've been thinking about a lot is, uh, how much of, um, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, in, in overall a scholar of international development, and I'm interested in, in poverty relief, and oftentimes we look at, at countries that are struggling, right, uh, you know, with, you know, a large proportion of their, of their population in poverty, and we attribute a lot of the poor governance to corruption, which I think is appropriate. But I also wonder how much of that sort of lack of government you know, uh, ability is really just, they don't know, right? So that governments learn, I mean, it's not that the officials don't know, they're you know, well-trained and intelligent and, and, uh, and so forth. It's that governments, actually government knowledge is different than sort of government officials' knowledge, right? Government knowledge is, is something you write down and you make rules. Right, and you have procedures uh, and and roles in government of people that that you know that that you know take on uh, those capacities to manage uh, you know these problems, and so uh, my question is how much of of what we're seeing uh, you know in you know challenges in governance really aren't so much challenges of corruption but challenges of capacity, uh, and then I guess to flip the question a little bit more, how much of that you know. Uh, how much of corruption is simply just uh, an inability or lack of knowledge of, of governments of how to how to control it, right? So sort of how rules and roles that are you know uh, and procedures that are specifically and explicitly focused on on, on uh, the control of corruption. Yes. So uh, big questions that I, I'm not going to provide you with a definitive answer here, but um, certainly. The, that I mean, I know this study that you're talking about, which is a very interesting um, uh, study. Um, is a question of what are you talking about when you're talking about cultural norms, right? So, so we see in that study a correlation between the TI index uh, and, um, and and a certain kind of particular behavior, right? Um, um, do we take the TI index as somehow being a good summary of the culture of the particular countries that are being um, that are being uh, talked about. Um, I think that's a little, that's a pretty much of a reach, right, <laughs> to, to do that. You're seeing a correlation, but you know, you're kind of raising almost more questions than, than, uh, than are being, than are being, than, than, than are being, than are being answered. Um, and of course, the, 
you know, because uh, I come into it out of economics, so that means me. It means I'm sort of. I understand the differences in culture, but I'm always a little skeptical of using that label as a way of answering questions. You know, so that it's certainly true that in psychology you see people changing their culture over time, you know, in, uh, or in history. I mean, it's not as if these things are are like anchored forever. Um, and and I think the thing that that maybe can be brought to this field by so, from sociology and psychology. Um, is some kind of sense of how you would change people's norms. My thought is that, yeah, that, that would be useful, but it's not going to work unless there's something real there. I mean, th there sometimes have been anti-corruption groups that have said, what we need is education. We need to start with the kids when they're five and teach them how to be good. Okay, that's a piece, but if you teach them all how to be good, and then the system itself is still working the same old way, then they are just going to be suckers. Right? They're going to be the, you know, the, the, it's not going to work. So there has to be a, a structural change at the same time as people are being um, educated. In, it has to be worth it in some broad um, normative sense. I mean, I don't mean worth it in the mon monetary terms, but I mean, it has to be um, uh, uh, the, the education uh, pro program has to be consistent with you know what the way people are going to interact uh, in the in the um, in, in, in the real world. Now I take your point about some countries or um, sectors uh, uh, trying to produce something: education, health, highways, and not having really very uh, people who have the 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 knowledge to really do it very well. Right? Um, and um, and, and well, it, that's, a, that can certainly happen. It's not obvious that corruption is much of a solution for a strong version of that. Right? Nobody knows how to build a road. No, there's nobody to corrupt, right? I mean, they're not going to build any roads. Um, but it is that you're certainly there's certainly part of a reform thing, which is asking of whether people can actually do the job that you would think would be you know, worthwhile, uh, worth, worthwhile doing. Some of you may know um, uh, Ben Olken is a guy who does a lot of research on, on Indonesia um, and on road building in Indonesia. And, uh, and part of what he was finding as a, as a, as a reform solution was, okay, you b both get the individual people in the villages who know that the roads are no good, and, but they don't know how to build roads. And you put them together with people who are coming from uh, who have some more expert knowledge who can um, evaluate what's going on and help to make that change. So I think that's part of a trick, is how would you put together local knowledge about what's, about what's happening and the kind of expertise that might be uh, helpful you know, going, uh, 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 going forward. Yeah. Okay, Let other people ask questions. Okay, so yeah, we have 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So if I can ask, there's two mics one on that side and one on this side. So if you don't mind, if you could please go up to the mic, because we need it for, because it's being live stream, live stream. We can't get rid of the spotlight, I guess. We passed NAFTA, a lot of foreign direct investment in Mexico, mm -hmm. and 94% um, of the uh, investments by these firms, uh, they engage what's called a protection contract in order to guarantee that there's no increase in wages during the life of that contract. Now, clearly, in the United States, Canada, and Germany, these protection contracts are illegal. And we have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which basically covers anything of value to assist in getting business. So I, the question I have is, why aren't mm -hmm. these contracts covered by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and why don't we prosecute mm -hmm. on the American side these people who engage in these contracts? Um. It's not a question I can answer. I mean, I, I understand. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, um, it's, not, it's not a question. What, I'm getting an echo. What? Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I, it's not a question I can answer. I think it, um, I don't know to what extent the FCPA could, in fact, cover um, these kind, this kind of, of, of behavior. It is covering, the FCPA is covering U.S. firms um, Paying bribes or engaging in contract to get business abroad, right? And so you're, you're suggesting that they, you're worried about the competition between the firms in Mexico and competitors in the U.S. I gather. 
but yeah. Effectively, yeah. Right? The effect on American workers and also the effect on the competition. But you, you, you apply your corporation. Corporations should behave morally. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Legal yeah. No, no, no. I, 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 I take, I take your point. It's just the the mechanism for dealing with it is not going to be the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Maybe NAFTA, maybe it should be somehow incorporated into NAFTA or something, but it is, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act has a fairly narrow uh, range of, of, of problems that it, can, that it can deal with, and unfortunately, that isn't one of them. But not a very satisfactory answer, but. Yep. Okay, and Somebody maybe else? if we could take a few questions at the same time, so if you would please ask your question and then we'll hear from you. What's the role of the... Uh, you can turn that light down, it's really... I think people can see us. What's, what's, the, what's the role of the CIA, the IMF, the World Bank, and U.S. corporations in promoting corruption around the world, especially in Latin America? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and somehow uh, we went after uh, Torrijo, and the CIA had to take him out. Mm -hmm. And he was a very good, I think, uh, leader for Panama. And then later on, uh, the Noriega, who worked for the CIA, mm -hmm. and eventually we sent mm -hmm. the military to take him out. In other words, mm -hmm. we first use corruption, pay him, to see if they will do or bring the favor of the U.S. corporations. And if that didn't work, then we send the jackals after them. And if that didn't work, then we send the military after them. So could you please comment on, <laughs> on this? Thank you. Yeah. No, I... I Do you want to take some more okay. a couple more? Okay. All, right. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Louise Shelley from George Mason University. One of the questions that impresses me when I look at controlling corruption in Latin America, how much more involved the business community is in many countries in Latin America in addressing corruption than in other parts of the world? And is there any um, explanation or understanding that your research has contributed to help explain this phenomenon? Thank you. Good. Okay, and one last question, because then we'll need to. Well, this along the lines of the other man, the complicity of Western institutions in money laundering. Mm -hmm. The African woman, this was some come fraud in Africa, and she said, yeah, but you guys have to help us get those guys, because they get the money mm -hmm. out of those countries, mm -hmm. and they want it to be in a place where there's a rule of law. Mm -hmm. And we have statutes here, Delaware and Nevada, I think, where it's perfectly legal to set up a shell company, and mm -hmm. you can hide the beneficial owner, mm -hmm. not to mention real estate. Okay. Um, those are, I think those are actually, maybe you, you may have more to say about the, about the money laundering, but no, I first just maybe to start back with that last uh, question. It's exactly right that the, that the um, uh, it's not just the U.S., there's quite a lot of wealthy countries that are facilitating uh, the transfer of, of money. It's not all from corruption, but other kinds of, of, of illicitly gained money into into safe havens, you know, if you if you earn a lot of money in a very poor country, you probably don't want it there. You want to get it somewhere into the into the um, into the um, international um, uh, uh, market. Um, and I think it is a serious problem, particularly there are certain states in the U.S. that make it very easy to um, to do this. Singapore, which is always pointed to as oh, it's not corrupt, but it is a major financial paradise. Um, so it's, that, that needs to be part, I only just had one little slide there, but it certainly needs to be part of the things that we are, are, um, are, are, are thinking about. Um, I don't have an answer for Louise's point. Um, uh, maybe the business in Latin America is more alive to the problems that they face uh, uh, because of, of, of corruption which limits uh, competition or which uh, leads to threats of violence or something like that. Um, Probably, I mean, Louise has more to say. I don't know. Um, the, the, your question about the CIA complicity in um, in corruption, or the or the use of corruption as a sort of a of a, a, a tacit uh, foreign policy tool, um, in the quotes, right, um, is certainly not something I've studied myself. But I I, I know of, as, as you do, of examples of that of that. Um, 
of, of, that, of, of that happening, um, and um, along with assassinations and all kinds of other things, we can hope that that's not happening at least at the same level uh, uh, today. We certainly have plenty of you know, historical uh, cases um, um, of, of that. Um, uh, and um, I don't think it's, um, um, well, uh, how can I speak? I can't speak for what the CIA is doing, but um, other than that, I think they have, they, that it's that the l l level of, of intersection between corruption and violence and, and, and U.S. foreign policy is, is less intense or less of a problem today than it was, but I could be proved wrong, so I'll be quiet. You, but you may have more to say about some of those. Oh, just on, on the money laundering question, uh, you know, uh, um, some collaborators and I have done uh, several studies on this and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in kind of an audit study and a field experiment. And, uh, uh, and it is true. Uh, Delaware is the easiest place in the world to get an anonymous shell company. Uh, and uh, um, at least, this, you know, the many places we've tested, hundreds of places we've tested. Yeah, you so, went around trying to set, set up shell companies. Yeah, right? yeah, we, yeah. We, yeah we, we, we learned how easy it was to set, set up shell companies around the world. So, uh, so and, and the United States doesn't seem to be particularly interested in, in, in solving that problem. So, you know, I mean, we talk about tax havens uh, like, uh, you know, British Virgin Islands or Seychelles or Cayman Islands. They had end up actually being really pretty compliant with international law. It was very hard to get an anonymous shell company in those places. Um, but, uh, but it was easy in the United States and in, in many of the other developed economies. So, um, yeah. so that, uh, now in terms of the other Western institutions, the World Bank is keenly interested in you know, overcoming these money laundering problems because the single biggest worry we have about money laundering is grand corruption. So that, that's, the, I th we think the biggest, the, the biggest reason for these shell companies, the, the most money that moves, tends to move from, the, from, from these grand corruption yeah. scandals. Yeah, you, you, know, you think you're supporting a project that's supposed to help economic development, and then it all, yeah, it just all goes out all into just Switzerland or somewhere. Yeah. 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 And the other piece of it has to do with, with real estate and art, you know, kind of investment in hard things yeah. in wealthy countries. Uh, I, well, I don't know, I have a sense of volume there, but it's, uh, Another uh, piece of this of this story about the relationship between the interest of corrupt people in getting their money into the money center of financial markets uh, and wealthy parts of the of, of the country and the and the institutions that facilitate that are are a um, are a problem. Yeah. Okay. So Susan, thank you. You're a wealth of information, and we're so grateful that you took the time to share some of it with us. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to